I invite you to find your sermon notes, and as you're doing that, is everybody ready for the holiday season? Okay. Yeah, some people are so excited, they think this is the best time of the year. Now, there are other people, they dread this time of year. And still others think that this is a time of year that you simply just try to get through. That whole Norman Rockwell image that so many have of this season is far from what many of us are expecting. And according to the news, thanks to recent events, this year can be especially troubling, especially if the topic of politics gets brought up. Mm. And not only these days are we worried about the things going on in our own lives, now we worry about so many other things that are happening all around us. And, you know, it, it's something that we're just conditioned from even the time we, we wake up. We get up in the morning to an alarm clock. Not a comfort clock. It's an alarm <laughs> clock. And then you turn on Bad Morning America... And you listen to all the things that are going on, and, and not only do you hear about problems uh, in our nation, but then even beyond in Israel, North Korea, and dozens of other places all around the world. And then they turn to our local news, and you realize how much evil has happened right in our own backyard while we were sleeping. And then you sit down in the, morning, in the morning when you eat your Wheaties and read the newspaper, and there's always a lot of good information in there, huh? <laughs> Get in your car, turn on the radio, and you continue to hear the, the barrage of negative and negative and negative. And then as you get into this time of year, so many of us realize the the commercialism that is all around us, the, the stress for so many that don't have enough time to get everything done, enough money, coordinating schedules, and, and you got to do everything or just enough so you don't make people mad. And then today you're going to come to church and your pastor is going to encourage you to have a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> How are you doing so far? Well, in the midst of all the stress and the chaos, some of us wonder how that's even possible. And so as we get started, now after I've got you to a certain place, I want to just ask you to take a deep breath, relax your shoulders, and just breathe. One more time. If you fall asleep today, completely fine. I mean, I want you to realize where you are. This is a place where God's people come to worship our God. To be reminded that He is far bigger than anything we face. And unfortunately, we live so many other hours and days out into the world that we desperately need this time to recenter us and help us to remember that our God is sovereign. He is in charge. And no matter what we're facing in the midst of any strife and chaos and confusion and, and everything else, God is still in control. And many of us know that when we're here. We forget that when we leave sometimes. We think it's all up to us. The Apostle Paul is, is always one who has, who has fascinated me because so many of his writ, writ, letters were written right in the midst of prison. And so in a place, and if you read some of the things that happened to him, the beatings and, and, and the, the shipwrecks and all the kinds of things that happened, you could see somebody who could get have a long list of things to be angry at God about. But he didn't. 
he found a way, even in the midst of what many would look at as an awful situation, and he would be reminded of who his God was. This morning, I want us to, to look at these words that he wrote in the midst of one of those Roman prisons. He said, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about <coughs> such things. Good News Bible, that, that fourth verse says it this way, May you always be joyful in your life in the Lord. Is that even possible? Is it possible to always be joyful no matter what you're facing in your life? And I'm going to tell you, it absolutely is. So I want us to look at some things that Paul said, and I think we can apply that for this holiday season, even how to have a happy Thanksgiving if we'll do what he's encouraging us to do. And the very first thing he says is, worry about nothing. Verse 6 says, don't be anxious about anything. The Amplified Bible says, do not fret or have any anxiety. How many of you agree that's easier said than done? Amen. Yeah. I've said it before, many of us think that worrying is our spiritual gift. <laughs> it's not. You'll see in your notes this study that was done by Walter Calvert. And he did a study about worrying. And he said, 40% of what we worry about never happens. So four out of the ten things you can just throw out. Unfortunately, some of us, we don't know which four of those are. So we worry about that. Well, 40% never happen. 30% of your worries are simply concerned about the past. And the problem with that is you can't change anything that is in the past. You can't even worry about the future. It's only today that you can, you can really focus on so in those two, 70% of our worries are worthless. 12% of our worries about needless health concerns. And I do understand because as you get older, every little weird feeling you associate, and don't ever go on Google and look up your symptoms. Uh, it's like the hypochondriac had written on his tombstone, I told you I was sick. <laughs> so these are needless health concerns. 10% of your worries are really about petty issues. Things that, no ma that really don't matter. Know anybody that worries about things that don't matter? Don't an elbow. Okay, oh, we got an admission, come up and tell it, we've got a witness. And then only 8% are legitimate concerns. But worrying, as we well know, changes nothing. It's been said, it is stewing without doing. It's like being in a rocking chair. You're working awful hard, but you're going nowhere. And I will tell you once again, there are no such thing as born worriers. It is something you have learned. Some of you had moms 
and dads and other people in your life who worried about everything and taught you to worry <laughs> about everything. And so you've learned it from experience, and that's the good news, because it is something you can unlearn. Amen. <coughs> so how do you unlearn it? Jesus said this, Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Amen. What he's saying is, don't open the umbrella until it's raining. Don't worry about tomorrow. Today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. And he says, don't do that. So here's the key. If you want to reduce some stress in your life, live in the present. Live today. Whenever God tells us not to do something, I want you to know so often, he gives you something to replace it with. He doesn't say just don't do it. He tells you what to do. He says, don't worry. And then he goes on to say, do pray about everything. Right, right. Instead of worrying, you ought to pray. In everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And I've actually heard people say, I don't have time to pray. I'm too busy. I don't... Now, I don't know what kind of prayers they're thinking they have to do. <laughs> you can pray anywhere at any time. Amen. Amen. And, and, you know, if you use the time you were worrying for praying, you'd have a whole lot, lot, a whole lot less to worry about. Right. And if you <laughs> prayed as much as you worried... So much would change. So you, you don't even add any prayer time to your schedule. Just replace it with all your worry time. You catch yourself worrying. That is a time to pray. And notice it says that in everything. If you would, underline in everything. Not just some things, but in everything you can pray about. Some of people think that, that God only cares about religious stuff. He doesn't care about my car payments or whether or not my tires may go out or where my kids are. He, he doesn't care about that kind of stuff. He just cares about God stuff. Wrong. It's all God stuff. You're His child. And if it's something that is worrying you, it matters to Him. And so you can talk to Jesus about anything because he's in, interested in everything that's going on in your life. Post-nasal drip. <laughs> Psoriasis. All of it, if it's a concern to you, if it's something that's bothering you, he wants you to share it because he's interested in every detail of your life. Philip's translation says, when you pray, tell God every detail of your needs. That means the big things and the small things. Because God knows every detail of your life. He knows everything about you. He gave you a unique thumbprint, a unique voice print. He has made every snowflake unique. And he's got no problems handling the details of your life. And notice it says that we are to do that with petition. What is a petition? A petition is a specific, detailed, direct prayer. Too many people pray very vague. Lord, just bless me. Well, what does that mean? A lot of people couldn't even define that if you... Because if you, sometimes a problem is a blessing that you don't realize. Right. But we don't pray, God, give me more problems. Right. <laughs> but when we're in prayer, be specific about the things that are going on in your life. 
1 Peter 5, 7 says this, Unload all your worries on Him since He is looking after you. That word unload literally, literally means to drop right where you are. It doesn't mean carry it any further. It just means drop it. Give it to God right there. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, You can put throw, all, throw the whole weight of your anxieties upon Him, for you are His personal concern. Yes, amen. I was reminded this week about a study that discovered that, that people who go to church each week tend to live, on average, 5.7 years longer. So that may explain why some of you are... St no, it, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's because, and, and what, well, I, I think part of it is because we've learned, especially when we come in here, to give everything to God. To know that He's got this. That we can trust Him. It is so important for us to realize that our God is willing to take it all on Himself. And James says, you do not have because you do not ask God. And we need to ask God to help us with our worries and our problems. And here's the insight. If a problem is big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. You catch yourself worried about something, <clears throat> take a moment and give it to God. We need to worry about nothing, pray about everything. And then number three, Paul says, you need to thank God in all things. It says, in everything, when you pray, pray with thanksgiving. Good News Translation says, always asking Him with a thankful heart. You know, the healthiest human emotion is not love, it's gratitude. They've actually found that, that when a person is extremely grateful in their life, it actually boosts their immunities. It, it, it causes them to be resistant to stress and less susceptible to illness. It is the healthiest emotion when we are full of gratitude. And people who are grateful are happy. They're thankful for everything. They begin to see God's blessings everywhere. For the people around them, for anything that they're given, for the kind word that came to them, they are able to see God at work all around them. And they are able to thank Him in everything. But conversely... People who are ungrateful grateful are miserable because nothing makes them happy. Can I get a witness? Yeah. <laughs> They're never satisfied. It's never good enough. When you cultivate that attitude of, of being grateful and thankful for everything in your life, it changes your perspective on everything. After this sermon, we're going to sing an old, an old hymn, Count Your Many Blessings, Name Them One by One. And if you've never actually sat down and done that and actually thank God for so many things in your life, I want to encourage you to do that. I've done that so many times. And I can fill a page quickly of things that I am thankful for. And I want to encourage you to make a list even this week and to be, be, realize how much you and I have been blessed. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to underline that word, circle it, whatever you want to do, the word in. Give thanks in all circumstances circumstances a lot of people misinterpret this verse 
And it says, and they think it says, give thanks for all, all the circumstances going on in your life. For all the bad things that are happening. The Bible doesn't teach that. But it says that we can give thanks in every circumstance. If I wreck my car, I'm not going to say, praise God, I wrecked my car. <coughs> but even in that situation, the car may be wrecked, but I'm still alive. This is a matter of perspective. And you can always find a reason to praise God, even in the darkest times of your life. We have one of our members who, when faced with the news of cancer, some of you know how devastating that news can be. This person actually smiled not because he had cancer but because he knew because of his relationship with God God was going to be with him every step of the way and that he was not alone and because of his faith he was actually <coughs> able to see cancer not as devastating but as a new challenge that he was going to face with God that kind of perspective is something that seems to be extremely rare and yet ought to be something that every one of us as God children should have. <laughs> that even in the midst of the, the toughest times, we should be able to still see God and to know that He is with us, that He is way bigger than any problem we're about ready to face, that He's going to give me the power to face whatever it is, and that I'm even going to grow in this experience as I face it with His help. Got something in on the internet, and uh, it, it again is kind of explains uh, a lot of, of our, uh, our perspective and how we choose to look at things. One says, I'm thankful for paying taxes because it means that I'm employed. I'm thankful for the mess I have to clean up after the party because it means that I've been surrounded by my friends. I'm thankful for the clothes that fit a little too snug because it means I have enough to eat. I'm thankful for a lawn that needs mowing, windows that need cleaning, and gutters that need fixing because it means that I have a home. I'm thankful for all the complaining I hear about the government because it means that we have freedom of speech. I'm thankful for the lady behind me in the church who sings off key because it means I can hear. I'm thankful for the weariness and aching muscles at the end of the day because it means that I've been capable of moving. I'm thankful for the alarm that goes off in the early morning hours because it means that I'm still alive. It's all a matter of perspective. For so many of us, we need to be able to give thanks to God in every circumstance. Not for every circumstance. God does not want you to be thankful for evil or for uh, the awful things in our lives. But even in the midst of when those things are happening, we have plenty of reasons to focus on God and to realize the blessings that are still in our lives. This one's so important, this insight. Don't focus on what you've lost. Focus on what you have left. So many of us still have so much in our lives to be thankful for. Amen. This Thanksgiving, we're thankful for the people in the sound booth who adjust what <laughs> <one night> change. <laughs> I mean, this is going to be an opportunity for us to pause and to express gratitude for God in all that He's done. So we worry about nothing. We pray about everything. We thank God in all things. And then finally, number four, we think about the right things. 
Verse 8 says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. You want to reduce stress in your life, you need very often to change the way you think. Now, none of us uses our brains to our potential. You're like me, there's a lot more you could be doing. But, whatever you put in your brain is what's going to come out. Just like in a, in a computer, garbage in, garbage out. And that's, that's so much determines, you know, so much about our lives. They say whatever you feed your mind, whatever you think about is what's going to come out in your life because the way you think determines the way you feel. And the way you feel determines how you act. And Paul says if you want to change your life, you need to change what you're thinking about. So if you're reading a newspaper and watching TV all the time and you don't spend any time or very little time focusing on God's Word, you're putting a whole lot more negative in than what is positive. And I don't know why, but it seems to me like the majority of movies and TV today glorify the unhealthy instead of the healthy. Paul says, I want you to think about things that are true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable. <coughs> Fix your minds on those things and so some of us, we deliberately need to change the channels. We need to begin to focus on what is right. We need to focus on the things of God. Why? Because the root of so much of my stress is how I think. That's why you can take two people and put them in the same kind of situation, even in a storm, and one one disintegrates, they crumble, they, it's the worst thing possible could happen, and the other person is able to face it and see it as a new opportunity. Amen. Right. It, 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 is, it is amazing what happens, and a lot of it's based on, again, our perspective. Because obviously it's not the circumstance, it's your response. It's how you choose to view it. It's how you interpret life. It's your choice. Is it the end of the world or is it something that God is, is allowed to happen in my life so that He can take me to a new place? And I've got to choose how I'm going to respond to the problem. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What do you think about most? What dominates your mind? What, do you, what, what is it that you're always focusing on? So Paul says, worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Thank God in all circumstances or in all things. And then for... Think about the right things. And when you do that, what happens? Look at the result. He says, if you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. And His peace will keep your thoughts and your heart quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. Amen. Guarantee of peace of mind. A way to enjoy every single day. I mean, that's what so many people are looking for out there. They're looking for goat yoga, and they're using crystals, and, you know, diets and seminars and podcasts, and they're running from one couch to the next, trying to find this peace of mind, and yet it's so obvious. The Bible says that God's peace is His gift to you. And it can't be explained, it can't be duplicated, it can't be fabricated. It's a gift. So how do I get that peace of mind? 
So that no matter what I'm facing, I know that God is with me. How do I keep calm in the midst of a crisis? How do I remain strong even in the midst of a storm? How do I get that kind of peace? Look at that last line. As you trust in Christ Jesus. It is a relationship. Amen. And if you have never accepted that relationship into your life, there's nothing God would love more today than for you to ask Him to come into your life and to start that. Because that's where true peace is going to come from. As you trust in Christ Jesus. And look at the other phrase that says, His peace will keep your thoughts and your heart quiet. If you would, underline the word keep. The word for keep is a Greek military term that is literally a sentry. It is a garrison of soldiers that are there to protect. And so that word, the, 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 the people, uh, the Philippians would have fully understood the Roman guards that were protecting them. And a Roman legion, that sentry, would have guarded that city so that they could have peace. And so he's saying that because of your relationship in Christ Jesus, God will come and protect your heart. God says when I trust Christ, He puts a sentry guard on my mind that keeps me at peace when everything else wants to stress me out. That's the way you do it. So let me ask you, what's got you worried this morning? Some of us know Thanksgiving's coming, and already some, some of us, uh, it's coming. The invasion will be here soon. Some, it's health. Others, finances, marriage problems, kids, career, all kinds of things. But God says if you'll do these things, that He will send a sentry in your life and you'll find the peace that you could, couldn't even imagine. Right? We live in crazy times. And if we focus on all of the chaos and the problems of life, it can be very easy to feel defeated and stressed <laughs> and even wanting to hide from the world and avoid all of it. The encouragement today is whenever you begin to feel anything but thankful, to remember this passage, to worry about nothing, pray about everything, Thank God in all things, and even that last one. Yes, think about the, the things of God. Think about, think about Him. And when you do that, His peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So let's close in prayer. Well, God, we thank You that You give us peace. I pray that today, Lord, that there would be those who would take these, these steps. Let me ask all of you to pray this prayer in your own heart. Pray, Lord, help me to worry about nothing but to unload all of my worries on You. Cast my cares on You, all my anxieties. Rather than worry, I'm going to pray. Because God, I know that You hear my prayers. <coughs> Lord, I want to give You the details of my life. 
Father, help me to become more grateful for what I do have. Forgive me for all the times I've complained about what I no longer have or am able to do or certain people in my life. But instead, to live in the moment, to look around and to see all the blessings that you continue Amen. to give me in my life. Right. Thank you. who you are, God, that I can find your presence in every circumstance. Help me to realize that there's always something to be thankful for. Help me to focus my mind on the right things. Spend some time with you in the Bible reading your word every day. Fill my mind with the positive things, not the negative garbage that's out in the world. And I ask you to put your peace in my heart. And if you've never invited Christ into your life, I want to encourage you simply to say, Jesus, I turn the controls of my life over to you. And I ask you to come in to be my Savior, Help me to know that I am not alone. And I ask you to fill my heart and to give me that peace as I trust you more and more. Father, I ask you to hear all these prayers. And I pray your blessings on us as we continue to be reminded of who you are. Hear our prayer and all God's people say, Amen. Yeah.